And I'm going to introduce uh, our guests today, uh, speaking today on the topic, what comes after reconciliation, neoliberalism, colonialism, and the limits of apology. So in a moment, I'm gonna hand it over to Tina, who is going to facilitate the conversation first with Molemo Moloa, who is based in Johannesburg. Uh, Molemo has worked in various capacities at the intersection of creative practice and community organizing. She currently works on notor notions of ungovernability, social infrastructure, and cultural organizing, and relationships to nature. And she is one half of the artist collective, uh, collaborative, sorry, Made You Look, and a co-organizer of the Open Restitution Africa project. And we're also joined today by Brie Busk, who is an artist and activist who moved to Santiago, Chile in 2015 because she wanted to know what it was like to live and work in a country with more active social movements. She arrived just in time to participate in the historic feminist wave that is still in effect today. She works as a freelance English teacher and uses her spare time to write articles documenting the political situation in Chile. At present, her political work consists of participating in the Laura Rodig Brigade, the Art and Propaganda section of the March 8th Coordinating Committee, uh, which is under the acronym CF8M. She is also the primary English translator for any texts uh, the CF8M wish to distribute internationally. And with that, I would like to invite Tina to take it from here. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, as Max said, my name is Tina Monroe, and I'm a master's student here at Lakehead. Um, my former work prior to coming back to school was working at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation in Manitoba here, so my interest in this topic is um, close to home. So looking forward to discussing the international context. Before we get started, I would just like to do, I would not just like to do, I would totally like to do a lot of acknowledgement. Um, so Lake University, as rival as a part of Lake University, and this is a LIBA event, um, Lake University respectfully acknowledges that its campuses are located on the traditional lands of Indigenous people. Lake Kid Thunder Bay is located on the traditional lands of the Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. And Lake Kid Aurelia campus is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, um, which include the Ojibwe, the Odawa, the Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. Beyond territory acknowledgements, I also like to acknowledge um, that we are gathering virtually. And in this space land, we are still living bodies in space. So I want to take a moment just to so we can situate ourselves wherever we are on the earth together today and to think about um, those relationships we share with um, each other in the world. So I'd like to get started by asking um, Malemo a few questions. Um, it's a question for both of you, but I'm gonna start with Malemo. Can you summarize the state of struggles in South Africa today and how they are connected to the aftermath of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission or Truth and Reconciliation efforts of the past? Thanks, Tina. Thanks, Max. Thank you to both of you for, for inviting me here today. Really looking forward to the conversation. Um, and, and please do stop me if I start to kind of uh, rant and rave too much. Or I'll try and be um, uh, clear and brief. Um, so maybe by way of a kind of um, initial background, for those who might not know, um, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, started in the, the 1990s, um, sort of from 1995 um, onwards, um, and was in response to the shifts um, uh, in South African sort of political and sort of socioeconomic um, concerns after the so-called end of apartheid, um, sometimes called the dawn of democracy um, in South Africa. Uh, so apartheid runs kind of officially until about 1990 and then um, in principle, from 1990, the country starts to break down some of its very distinctly racialized um, controls, particularly over Black life um, in the country. And then in 1994, we have our first democratic elections for all um, people in the country um, and elect the first um, uh, sort of majority led uh, um, political party and government led by Nelson Mandela. And the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission emerged out of this time. And um, in large part, its intention was to uh, create a space for truth telling, um, for openness, um, for uh, particularly forgiveness. Um, it had quite a strong uh, Christian undertone in it. It was led by a still beloved um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who um, had been a quite 
radical political organizer in the 80s. Um, and with this large intention of reconciliation. Um, and in South Africa, reconciliation um, is a complex kind of concept. Um, probably best sort of um, uh, manifested for an international audience in the image of Nelson Mandela, who of course uh, becomes this character who brings together peoples who otherwise uh, the world might have imagined could never be together in a sense. Um, I think important to note that in the early 1990s, the apartheid state also um, began a systematic kind of undermining of um, uh, sort of internal black black relationships and attempted to particularly um, in some ways invent a kind of um, ethnicist conflict uh, that actually resulted in a kind of semi civil war. Um, and so by the time um, sort of Nelson Mandela is elected and we're moving into this reconciliation moment, we've actually kind of come very much to the brink of a point of violence that um, was quite difficult to walk back from. Um, and so actually a lot of the reconciliation was definitely a sort of black white imagination um, and, and a kind of question of race, but was also very much a question of um, a kind of uh, a place that South Africa had gotten to that was incredibly violent um, and increasingly hostile to try and create a sort of way forward. Um, and so was very much a part of reimagining a nation. Um, and kind of inventing a nation. Um, and the term that we <laughs> embraced at the time was the rainbow nation. Um, some people pointed out that there's no black in the rainbow. Um, and this becomes the kind of narrative that emerges in the longer term. Um, in that kind of uh, rainbow nation agenda, there's also at the same time, sort of just before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a whole lot of negotiation that happens between um, political parties who've been in exile, who've in fact taken up arms, um, who have been physically uh, fighting the apartheid state, um, as well as a number of internal groups. And they negotiate the kind of future of the country and a set of what, what are called the sunset clauses, um, which in many senses were about handing over a certain level, of, certain level of political power, but not necessarily any apology um, so so the, the, the word apology that's in, our t in the title of today's conversation doesn't really apply to South Africa, um, but also was not about um, handing over economic power in any way, um, and was um, uh, a kind of uh, negotiated settlement that uh, ensured uh, that the way that political power was handed over um, would give space to white South Africans to continue their lives to, to sort of a, a greater degree. Um, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission then looks to try and sort of address some of the traumas and pain um, that the, uh, the negotiator settlement has kind of dealt with the, the hardcore business and then the Truth and Reconciliation Commission dealt with a lot of the kind of emotions and pain. And the commission was primarily um, a process that you could choose to come to uh, there were a few people who were forced to come, but very few. Uh, you could choose to tell the truth. Um, if you were asked to come and give evidence and chose not to, there wasn't necessarily any um, particular punishment. And then within this kind of spe spectrum of, of um, a kind of Christian framework of it, um, there was a kind of amnesty given to most people who, who, who told the truth. Uh, last thing to mention is that um, the kind of uh, high levels of political power of the apartheid state were not called. Um, and a few of them were called and they did not come. Um, and they were not punished for that either. Um, so, so some people, so, so most of the people who came and got amnesty were lower level sort of policemen, security forces, and those kinds of people. How this kind of uh, continues to this day um, in terms of our political concerns, I think in every way, uh, we very much live in the shadow of what in fact Desmond Tutu had said at the time was unfinished business. So the TRC was in, in, intended to be the beginning of a process, the kind of opening up of wounds and the opening up of truths, but certainly not the end of them. 
Um, and I think in many ways it was politically expedient to, to behave as if the TRC then meant, okay, we've forgiven, now we move on, now it's over, which of course it wasn't. Um, so, so many of the people who first conceived of it saw it much more as an opening up and then a longer process should extend from that. And that was, that was not the case. One of the key things that wasn't continued was that certain people were identified as um, um, needing to then go through a judicial process. Um, and a, um, kind of a number of people did end up in prison, but it was very, very few. And in fact, we're now retrying a lot of apartheid cases um, only at the moment. There's one finished a few years ago, there's two or three currently on at the moment. Um, and those have not been pushed through the formal TRC structures, but have actually been done independently by families. So, and that gives you a sense of how much unfinished business there is. Um, at a kind of more underlying level, I think that um, one, of, one of the big things that remains is this kind of lack of apology um, and a continued sense of uh, white domination of the country in large and primarily based on economics. Um, so South Africa remains one of the most unequal countries in the world. Um, we have something like a 60% unemployment rate for young people um, and something like a 45% unemployment rate in general. And of course, the majority of that is black. Um, one of the big issues is also land, um, which, which at the moment is kind of a, a mainstream uh, question of the country and a lot of the work that I do, uh, which is the fact that in 1913, 80% of the land was given to uh, less than 1% of the population and 80% of the population was taken off that land. And that continued over and over and over again, um, right through the 1950s and even into the 1980s. Um, and that land hasn't really returned. Um, and the return of the land and restitution um, of, of land issues is a major concern of the country. Um, but one of the main things that really happened, particularly since 2015, has been a concern of and land as part of this, what has been lost in the process, spiritually, epistemically, cosmologically, and the ways in which we have maintained a lot of structures of colonialism and apartheid um, have, have continued. So, so some of you would have heard about the fallism movement, which, was, which started as fees must fall, uh, no, sorry, started as Rhodes must fall and eventually became fees must fall. And Rhodes is this colonial figure uh, that many of you would have heard of who, who was um, in our part of the continent quite a lot. Um, and there's a university named after him. There was a large sculpture um, of him on one of the universities and he was, he was physically pulled down. And of course, we've now seen a lot of, a lot of uh, the removal of monuments, but this starts in 2015. Um, and is, is, is as much about um, him and his figure there as it then becomes about the question of the curriculum of universities. Um, and then, as I say, economics being such a major issue um, as part of this reconciliation question, um, fees must fall becomes the fact that university is too expensive for the majority of our population because we haven't had this kind of financial shift. Um, and fallism is in many ways a kind of decolonial project um, but really it was a outpouring of the ways in which particularly young South Africans, black South Africans in particular, still feel as if uh, many of the infrastructures of um, everyday life do not reflect um, the, the sort of majority cultures of the country. And I think those infrastructures, the university being a, a good example of this, um, are, are infrastructures that in many ways have been able to continue. Um, and that were kind of exempt from reconciliation and their kind of uh, racist, sexist, um, multiple kind of, um, I suppose, inheritances of, of a violent past um, have kind of been skipped over by a lot of those truth and reconciliation processes that aim, aim the, the kind of lens at the most violent, most extreme um, issues. And what we see is the kind of uh, ubiquity of some of that violence in, in kind of the broader fabric of South Africa. And I think that's kind of um, the, the longer term extension of, of some of the processes that TRC started. Hope that makes sense. That was excellent sense. Um, what I'm gathering from what you're saying to me is that, or saying to all of us here today, um, is that the TRC kind of created this 
separate space wherein these things could be addressed but not acknowledged. And once they are parked, life or business can continue as usual. Um, so what I'm wondering is um, what sorts of imagination can happen to kind of bridge this gap? Like, I, I feel like um, people who have been subjected to these atrocities are, are left to kind of figure out their own way out of it. So I'm curious as to what your art practice has, um, I guess, has aimed to do to mobilize people to um, employ their imaginations um, to find ways that are, I guess, anti-state. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that's really um, was was definitely there in the 1990s, but uh, not as loud, but is, is emerging much more loudly now, is this kind of claim of um, the space of imagination in um, epistemes that come from who we are, as opposed to the ones that have been forced upon us. Um, and so there's much more space for um, engaging with kind of uh, completely different epistemic, ontological, cosmological positioning um, and to imagine from these kinds of spaces, um, not in the sense of being regressive and trying to go back to some, I don't know, originary African past or something, um, but uh, really uh, understanding the need to completely reimagine the structures that we, we live in. Um, and without question, I think creative practice has this incredible role in this, um, in enabling spaces of, of um, encouraging and uh, supporting and kind of collectively learning about these um, sort of uh, deep treasure troves of knowledge and ways of being. Um, and then to think about how they might um, exist between us in the, in the contemporary moment. Um, and I think that the other thing that, that creative practice has the potential to do, um, though it's of course not always the case, is to hold space and bring people into place um, and, and to kind of uh, enable processes and, and facilitate processes of, of imagining together. And that's very much a lot of what, a, a lot of the work that I am interested in doing. Um, and in some senses, um, I think when you particularly enable artistic practice to enter into other kinds of environments, um, so to work with say farmers and, and, and rethinking land um, or, or to work with say um, professionals or practitioners in, in, in other kinds of industries and environments and to um, recognize the kinds of knowledges that are, are possible in those spaces and to imagine with people who have these really um, deep knowledges. Um, I think there's a lot of capacity within creative ways of being and practicing that um, brings out a lot of the uh, interconnections and kind of um, crossovers also of the different ways in which people are wanting to be and the kinds of uh, strategies and approaches that a lot of people have already undertaken for themselves in how to kind of reimagine being politically. Um, but but the, those spaces don't always connect and we have a lot of flexibility and a lot of possibility as artists to kind of connect those, which is uh, the really kind of invigorating, inspiring work, I think of them, yeah. I've been doing some research and I came across um, Bembe's concept of necropolitical power. Mm -hmm. how the sovereign determines who lives and who dies by their proximity to power. And I've been thinking about how as indigenous people or myself in my own way, like how can I be the sovereign who allows life, but also allows to let die the preconceived notions of how the TRC should be shaped in my life. So I'm wondering if you could speak to how um, exercising of creative power is um, not only allowing life, but can also allow these ways of thinking to die in our minds and in our worlds. And what change mm. Absolutely, absolutely. I think there's, um, I mean, with the work that I've been doing with land and, and working with people who work the land, um, death becomes a really interesting space um, because uh, there is so, so much capacity in death um, within uh, like composting. <laughs> uh, if you could get a farmer to start talking about composting and death. <laughs> and um, I, th I think that one of the things that is, I, I, I have come to really take as an incredible privilege of working from my context um, is that despite the many, many, many limitations of South Africa, uh, we are a majority peoples. Um, and working from the place of a, of a black majority um, 
does enable the possibility to um, imagine and recreate and to, and to potentially let go of the kind of constructs, even if temporarily. They can temporarily die and we can focus on the kinds of imaginations that we're interested in, which I think can be quite difficult um, in minority spaces where you're constantly bouncing up against um, a structure that kind of denies um, your own practice. Um, and so because of that, we have a lot of, um, I think a lot of space to really galvanize and mobilize um, in a way that is, is really committed to creation um, ra rather than always to destruction. Um, and um, <laughs> to, uh, Robert Mugabe, for example, who was the, the leader of Zimbabwe some years ago and is like quite a, not even controversial, like problematic figure. <laughs> um, he, he made a really interesting point because, um, I mean, one of the things that reconciliation has, has really created in South Africa um, and this, this fact that we never had an apology is we don't, we don't fully have, um, because our, our transition was negotiated, we don't have a winner and a loser entirely in South Africa, which is quite different to Zimbabwe where there was a, there was a war fought and there was a winning side. And you see this in Namibia as well, even though Namibia, and, Namibia used to be a colony of South Africa um, and they, they fought a war and they won the war in a to large degree um, against the apartheid state. They, they got independence in 1990, took us another four years. Um, and you really see the difference, for example, in their museums, how they tell their national stories. And uh, Robert Mugabe at the time of um, Rhodes Must Fall in South Africa, he said, we don't need a Rhodes Must Fall, we've got his body because he's buried there and he's dead. <laughs> and he's very dead in Zimbabwe. That's not a question, you know? Um, and that's partly because of a much more radical politic of um, right and wrong that in some ways the truth and reconciliation process kind of muddied, I think, um, in the sense that there isn't a clear, for lack of a better word, like loser of this battle and a clear kind of um, signifier of um, who had the kind of um, ethical and um, political and kind of radical position of this is the right way to be. Um, and I think that's even more the case, say, in, in, in other parts of the world. Um, and the ability to lay to, to, to rest um, a certain, a, a kind of the, those kinds of colonial ghosts to some degree, I think does enable so much more imagination moving forward rather than constantly having to battle against the back um, background of a kind of colonial inheritance. Um, and that, that statement of Robert Mugabe stays in my head um, very much because of it. Yeah. yeah, we always do some kind of resurrection in our own ways without realizing it. And sometimes it's inherited too. Absolutely. I, I do want to comment on the apology thing, because I feel like in Canada, we have had an apology. And it's this kind of cognitive dissonance that creates so much like confusion in our minds too, where like the state is sorry, but uh, all these things keep happening. And I read this um, transformative article too, that like these states apologies yet computed abuses, especially in the worlds of um, vulnerable people like women, mm. in our relationships at home and makes abuses more, it, the stories become less and less meaningful. So it's like a different kind of numbing that happens over time where like the apologies don't really mean anything in any sphere anymore. This might be a great, um, go ahead. Just a, a, a quick note that that's, that's super interesting because I think, um, despite the lack of apology, there's also been the position to just move forward. Um, like somehow if someone doesn't apologize, maybe you just kind of um, recognize where someone stands and, and, and move forward. So for example, South Africa's, I think the only country in the world where people have um, effectively been in prison for being racist. Um, so, so, so we sent someone to, to prison just two, three years ago um, for, for calling a police officer the equivalent of the N-word. Um, <laughs> And a slightly more complicated process, but effectively this person was was jailed for being racist. Um, and I think those kinds of like even legal frameworks um, are quite unusual um, in in the world, and are are in many ways po possible, in part because a line had to be kind of drawn, I suppose, particularly some twenty something years after nineteen ninety four, 
um, the lack of apology means there, there has to be, I suppose, a kind of accountability that eventually develops. Again, because we're the majority, that's a lot easier, I think. Um, but yeah, it, it's an interesting point that you raised there. If I may, one more quick question. I'm, I'm curious about um, the response to creativity at the individual versus a collective level. Mm -hmm. I find sometimes there's also, like, there's like a nation who representation or identity in terms of I belong to this group and as a group we do this. But I find sometimes depending on where people are at in their journeys, it could be either too quick or too slow. And so how, when do you know the appropriate time to kind of break off and to carve something new, to give life to something that no one's seen of them, I think they're crazy. <laughs> that's yeah that's a that's a tough question um in terms of crazy i mean even challenging the state yeah uh, i mean south africa is a, a strange place in that i think um long, like a long history of really sort of patriarchal um like uh pretty much dictatorial state has made us quite subject and quite sort of easily subject to authority in some senses. Um, but then of course, um, decades of mass mobilization against the state means that at the same time, we are incredibly anti-authoritarian um, as, a, as a country, no question. Um, and and that, that kind of strange um, switching between those spaces can be quite tricky. Um, and so when, when entering radical ideas into a space, um, I find that you can get kind of either one or the other reaction from the same person, depending on how it's kind of positioned and presented. Um, and I think understanding this constant switching, um, but also understanding the histories that those come from, um, means that you can call on particular familiar understandings of, of um, an, an, an anti-authoritarian positionality, which I, I really love this, this term ungovernable, which comes from the South African history. Um, and and at, at some point there was this um, pirate radio station of the African National Congress that was in exile um, and the speech that came out, which was about rendering the country ungovernable. And we have a very strong political line of ungovernability, um, even to this day. Uh, we have a party called the Economic Freedom Fighters in Parliament, for example, who, who have become effectively the, the biggest um, opposition party in the country, um, who come to Parliament dressed in mine workers' clothes, um, which is kind of the image of the worker in South Africa because of our history, or in like domestic workers' clothing. Um, and they're an incredibly ungovernable party. And, and just those significations of the mine worker and the domestic worker are the kinds of um, imag imaginations that people are able to click into and understand this kind of tradition and where this um, story is coming from. They're like head to toe mine, mine workers um, clothing in red. Um, it's just a very particular kind of visual signification. Um, and I think understanding those uh, nuances of language um, and those nuances of familiarity um, become the kinds of strategies of um, enabling people to come with you um, and, and, and under, being able to utilize those and really connect to that kind of ungovernable strain in all of us is, is how you start to bring people with you slowly. Um, in my experience, that's kind of what I've seen. Yeah, the trick is to kind of convince them that you too are ungovernable. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is an excellent segue to transition to speaking with Brie and the experience in Chile and Santiago. So um, thank you, Valeno. Uh, Bria, I'd ask, uh, if, like you, if you could summarize the state of struggles in Chile today and how they're connected to the aftermath of um, Chile's student reconciliation efforts. I believe Chile's was in 1991. Mm -hmm. Uh, first of all, thank you, Malemo, for everything you said. I found so many points of resonance, like even though South Africa and Chile have so many differences geographically and beyond, but like there were so many points where I was like, yes, that is also so connected to our experience. So thank you. I loved it. Uh, so uh, we'll do the extremely brief history of the past 50 years of Chile. So um, I think an easy starting point is the election of Salvador Allende in 1970. 
So Allende had a vision for uh, making Chile into a socialist country, but in a top-down way. The idea is like to use the democratic process to uh, create socialism, basically. And the idea was to have an alternative to say like the Cuban process. So like, we don't need a revolution, we can do it a different way. Of course, it wasn't different enough for the powers that be because any sort of like socialist or communist project in the world was considered a threat at the time. So with pressure from the CIA, from the US, a lot of pressure was put on the Allende administration. Uh, that took the form of like economic pressure and sabotage and eventually a military coup in 1973. So um, that coup what resulted in a 17 year dictatorship under the presidency of uh, General Augusto Pinochet. And during that period, we had extreme human rights violations, uh, torture, disappearances, uh, imprisonment, outright murder, lots of uh, fabrication of uh, excuses to uh, eliminate basically any form of resistance that remained. So um, eventually, right, there was a lot of international pressure on the dictatorship, right? It was hard to ignore. And so, um, Pinochet and his administration, all of his uh, collaborators took some steps to try to consolidate their power and protect their project. So um, one of their main projects was the liberalization of the economy. Uh, thanks to Milton Friedman and the Chicago Boys, the Chilean economy was basically completely remade uh, through free market economics, like extreme policies of uh, privatization. And those um, policy changes were then locked in to a new constitution that was written in uh, 1980, I believe. And the idea was, is to draft the constitution in such a way that it would be so difficult to make large scale reforms that the model would be protected no matter what the future brought. Um, in 1988, uh, again, we have this mounting pressure, both domestically and from abroad uh, to at least make a kinder, gentler uh, dictatorship. And Pinochet in a gamble to kind of legitimize his authority for like the next eight years or so, um, called for a plebiscite and the plebiscite would be, okay, do we continue as we are now or do we have a return to civilian rule? And I think he clearly would not have called for it if he didn't feel secure in the outcome. And shockingly, even though the plebiscite was uh, held under very dubious conditions, democratically speaking, uh, the people still were able to get a majority for a return to civilian rule, right? So, here in is the problem. So we have uh, new um, elections are called for. We have a new president and elected. And under that presidency, we have our Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But the problem is, is that what many people don't see from the outside is that this was not a clean break at all. This was not a end of the dictatorship. Everyone is gone. Now we can start anew. No, uh, in fact, Pinochet was, uh, thanks to the constitution that he oversaw, he was able to uh, remain in government as a senator for life, which was only stripped later on. And in fact, many people who participate in the dictatorship didn't see any consequences at all. Right? Uh, through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, there were also problems of scope. For example, it only addressed with uh, addressed human rights violations that were the result uh, or that resulted directly in death. So in a country where there was like large scale cases of torture, including like sexual torture and disappearances, that was, I feel like a really big problem in it. But also, how can you have this process when the people who conducted these crimes are still 
in the government are still like captains of industry, influential in every sphere of life, right? So the result is, is that we didn't have a complete, like we didn't have the complete truth and we didn't have the complete reconciliation. And to this day, there are still cases that continue to come up. But to this day, we also get to live alongside politicians who were Pinochetistas, right? People who you can easily find pictures of them shaking hands with the dictator, you know, thanks to Google, but they have been allowed to launder their images, not suffer any direct consequences, and also not change their politics, particularly, like, or in a consequential way, right? They say, oh, no, I was never in favor of the dictatorship, but I like its work, right? So it's just become like a game of language rather than a substantial shift. Um, a really, uh, a case that comes to mind immediately is right now we're in the process of a constitutional convention and uh, we have Jorge Aranzibia, who was an admirable and commander of the armed forces under Pinochet, a Pinochet lover on every level. He was elected to be a delegate in the convention and nominated himself to the Human Rights Committee. So we can't say that there has been a real break with the past when we have someone who's complicit in human rights violations on the committee to discuss human rights in a potential new constitution, right? I mean, that's a significant issue, but that's only one of many, many examples. Um, Another problem was that um, the ruling coalition that kind of inherited control of the government after the dictatorship decided to keep all of the neoliberal economic policies. And of course, they were largely protected by the constitution, but they said, no, actually, these are not so bad. You know, this can be a bonus. We will keep this. So Again, the result is we have a country that has kind of continued to nosedive into inequality and um, a good quality of life is available for those who can pay for it. Private schools, private healthcare, uh, private everything, essentially. If you can pay for it, you have a really good quality of life, but most people can't. So the result is like you could go into debt or fall into poverty. Right? It's a very like divided society in that way. Right? Uh, so 30 years later, right, in 2019, after 30 years of this kind of uh, culture of impunity for human rights violations and the increasing consequences of our neoliberal economic model, we had a popular uprising here in 2019. And the main issues at the heart of that were, of course, wanting justice for the human rights violations and the crimes that have accumulated under democracy. For example, like the extrajudicial killings of indigenous Mapuche people in the South, right, in their ancestral territory. Uh, also, we have people who've been killed in other periods of protests people who have been jailed for their political activity. And then within the uprising itself, we had uh, a continued theme of violent state repression resulting in like the large scale maiming of protesters, like hundreds of people were shot in the face with um, rubber bullets resulting in loss of eyesight and other injuries. Right? We also had people who were killed and we have lots of people who were arrested for participating in the protests. So something that characterizes the kind of political moment today is that when people talk about impunity, they are still angry about the crimes of the dictatorship, but they also um, see the crimes that were uh, committed under democracy as part of the same legacy that there was a continuity of impunity, not a break when democracy arrived. 
I could go on, but <laughs> that's those are the main points. Um, I'm curious if there was an apology in Chile with- um... You know, I'm not actually sure if there was an apology, but if there was, I think it was quickly forgotten because even the, the report that was generated by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it was distributed, but then kind of like forgotten quickly, right? It was like, the, I think my impression is that there was this strong urge of saying, let's just keep moving, right? right? Like, let's not disrupt things too much, which is why today we still have the constitution written under the dictatorship. We still have Pinochetistas in government. We still have people looking for their disappeared loved ones, right? So there's even a binary. There was, yeah. Sorry, there's a binary between this, like the violations were only um, convicted if they were in death. So it almost like legalized any other type of oppression or disappearing of anyone. Like in yeah. you know? Yeah, I think that's a good observation because like during the revolt here where there was like large scale protests all over the country, like there were videos that we would like see through our WhatsApp groups of saying, oh, someone being grabbed and put into an unmarked car. We also had a, uh, a curfew and we had the military in the street. And the last time the military was used uh, against the civilian population in this country was under the dictatorship. So people who had lived through it were traumatized, but their children were also angry because they know what the symbolism of that is. And of course, beyond the symbolism, you have military in the street. So talking about the children, then I'd like to maybe pivot to the protests of 2019 and mm -hmm. led to that. Um, Cause I think it was largely, as I understand it was largely organized by youth. And I think that's a really mm -hmm. powerful position to be in. So. Um, I'm really curious about the um, like the mindscape of youth who grew up in the shadow of like such a TRC and violent state with all this crazy stuff going on. Um, what kind of mass mobilization like that has meant to um, anti neoliberal movement? Uh, there is nothing better in life than seeing like Chilean high school students protesting. They are like the fierce spirit that like animates everyone, I think. You know, in a country where we have all these different social movements, like you can't not love the high school students. Um, so we talk about the student movement, the first wave of it um, under democracy in 2006, where we had like the penguin revolution of the high school students. And that also was a movement against neoliberalism, talking about uh, private education. And they were talking about the educational sphere, but within that was a critique of the system as a whole, right? So it's not the first time the students have been the ones to kind of like open the door for everyone else and invite them to participate. Um, there's always like for the entire time I've lived here, like since 2015, there's always been a certain degree of student movement activity, certain degree of protests. Um, but I would say in the lead up to the revolt in October, 2019, there had been like an escalating violence to it where the police um, were kind of taking things to the next level in how they reacted to the student protest. Uh, for example, you got to see um, riot police entering the high schools to chase students, which was like a violation of the educational space and also like more aggressive tactics used against them. But the students in a way they're fearless. And in fact, the first generation that participated in student protests after the dictatorship was called like the generation without fear because they were born within democracy. So they didn't necessarily carry the direct trauma that their parents did. Of course, there's still inherited trauma from that, but they, um, they felt more empowered to return to these types of mass mobilizations, right? That were so dangerous before. But uh, yeah, there was this kind of building tension that I think anyone in Santiago could feel between the police and the, the high school students. 
And eventually they launched a campaign in response to a really minor fare increase that wouldn't even affect student fares. Uh, they decided to have an evasion campaign. So you would have like groups of 50, 100, 150 students uh, jumping turnstiles together and occupying platforms. And it was wonderful. But then uh, the, they started anticipating these uh, student invasions and the police started blocking off the stations and the students started tearing them back open and entering again. And it escalated very quickly, right? Because people were caught up in the moment of it, started joining the students and so they were definitely the first ones, but they inspired everyone else to join in. And also the older generation got to see their children getting brutalized by the police for what was a nonviolent protest, a very rowdy nonviolent protest, but still nonviolent. And you got to see them like 16, 15, 14 year old school girls getting shot point blank with rubber bullets. And that's something that you can't easily forget. So that same evening where things escalated, right? Uh, everyone went out to do noise demonstrations in the evening, spontaneously, like all over the city and in other parts of the country. And from then it only escalated. Was there like a demographic difference among those who were motivated to take to the streets and protest in such ways? I could feel like, or was it just kind of like, was it, was there unity among classes, among different groups of youth, or was it just kind of uniting under the banner of oppression of these Well, states? among the students or among everyone? Among, well, I would start with the students. Um, okay. And then branch out from there. Okay. Well, I would say like uh, the students who are generally the ones most active in the student movement in general, uh, attend what we call like emblematic schools, which are public high schools that are still like high quality, which are limited in number, right? Usually if you want a good education, you go to private school. And the private schools are generally religious and exclusively religious and really suppress any sort of like culture of protest within them. So it's going to be the public schools. And also these uh, emblematic high schools, they have a mixed class character, which I also think is really important because some people want to send their students there because it's a good school. Others, you know, might just, it could be a public school that they can send their children to. And I do think that um, demographic mix is important um, for, and also like, uh, students inherit, inherit the political legacy of a particular school, right? There are schools that throw down. <laughs> and like, so you know that if they say, oh, the students from uh, Carmela Carvajal, one of the uh, girls emblematic schools, if you hear about that, you say, oh yeah, those 14 year old girls will take over your building and run it better than you can. And they have a generational legacy of doing that because within these schools and their movements, they have a very quick cycle of training, right? So you have 17 year olds helping the 14 year olds and 13 year olds kind of begin to take on the responsibilities. Um. I think we're at 155 right now. So I think I would like to maybe direct some questions to both um, yourself and Malemo. Um, mm -hmm. I'm interested in how um, we can create spaces. I don't want, my focus on youth is more to become curious about how we can dream different futures for youth today in Canada and elsewhere in the world. But I'm also interested in how, um, even though us people who are aging can still maintain our motivations from the youth that we are influencing. And with that comes responsibility in our own praxis. So what I'm interested in is your own personal relationships um, with the intersection of art, the imagination, and activism and the material. So how do you reconcile these two in your work? I guess we can start with um, maybe Malemo. Invite you back into the conversation. Um, thanks, uh, Bri. That was that was that was really fascinating and and I think really interesting um, connections also between this kind of generational 
uh, issue um, and how these kinds of uh, struggles continue generationally, um, which is, is some of the work that I've done um, some years ago now, but was kind of um, an area of quite a lot of interest for me because we see so many of um, the replications of, I mean, in, in one of the things that really uh, got me interested was even just in physical movement. Um, so we have a strong protest tradition of song and, and dance. Um, uh, so we, we don't just kind of chant as we walk down the streets. There's like all sorts of things. Uh, can, can be kind of embarrassing if you don't have good rhythm to, to go to a protest. Um, and it's even just some of those like physical movements, the choices of song, um, the ways in which people physically embody protests often looks like something from 20 years before that young person was born. Um, and, and, and looks like the footage, say, of the 70s, which can be quite extraordinary to see how somatic some of those resistance histories are. Um, but maybe more to your, your question, Tina, I think that, I mean, for me, I, I come from a, uh, a tradition of um, a kind of political resistance that was quite committed to everyday life um, and a practice of uh, political organizing that was um, very much about kind of uh, localized uh, everyday existence and, and, and a political positioning around, um, yeah, I suppose sort of ordinary everyday, everyday life organizing. Um, which could in the you know during apartheid did end up people ended up in prison you know for for just trying to like help grannies with their um, uh, refuse removal for example uh, which is how how my father one one of the times my father ended up in prison in his flat um, and uh, that tradition I think is really valuable for me um, as a way of thinking about. Uh, the way that I choose to kind of operate in my own sort of uh, political positioning. And that connects quite well to the way um, I'm interested in, in, in artistic practice and creative practice as well. Um, in the capacity to take everyday life and to rethink everyday life and to rethink the way that we organize, not just in these kinds of, um, I suppose, meta political narratives, um, but also in much smaller scale um, communal um, everyday practice um, and to kind of reimagine what it means to relate to each other just in, in everyday existence. Um, we have this phrase from um, apartheid of, of, the, of what was called petty apartheid, which was this idea that apartheid did have these grand political like mass movements of people and removing people from from their land but they also just were petty they just did like things that broke you down in your everyday life and broke down everyday family relationships um and the, the recreating of those is um is, is not a simple practice and and the recreating of the kinds of just um, the ways in which trauma leaches into how you know, uh, couples relate. We have a massive uh, gender violence issue in South Africa, like epidemic. Um, and, and without question, that comes from some of these kinds of um, histories. And I think that my approach to a lot of my artistic practice is very much in, in, in the capacity for art to help us relook those kinds of everyday engagements. Um, and, and that's really a, a historical tradition, but also I think the capacities of what creative practice does. So for me, these things overlap very much and I definitely kind of enter into activism actually through artistic practice. There are many people who go the other way, um, but that, that's kind of been, um, it, it's been the most sort of motivating space for trying to reimagine what activism can be. Um, our, our traditions of activism have narrowed substantially over the last 20, 30 years. Um, and, and what activism looks like in South Africa has become quite specific, quite particular. Um, and I think creative practice also enables us to, to shift that um, and reimagine what, what forms of activism can be. Would you like to share your perspectives? Uh, on sure. 
uh, I was very into the uh, mention of like the kind of practice within everyday life. That's also a very big factor for me. Uh, so I have my personal practice, but I think perhaps like more importantly, the work that I do artistically and culturally that uh, is most, I think most rewarding for me is through my, uh, through my feminist group. So we are a section of a larger organization. There's about 40 of us and we intervene in public space through um, art and um, other types of like visual interventions. And we do a very wide variety of activities, but I think uh, we can kind of break it down into a few different categories. Like for example, we're very connected to kind of unearthing women's and feminist history and like stories of resistance, like going back before the dictatorship, of course, but also taking a lot from the resistance that our uh, forebears uh, carried out against the dictatorship because there was a very strong cultural element uh, to that. For example, um, there is an embroidery tradition of depicting these kind of uh, collaged embroidered scenes of resistance and violence. Um, they're called the uh, arpieras and they're incredibly beautiful, but they capture history. So that kind of um, history and practice of like creating textiles and documenting our resistance is something that we carry on. Like it's part of like honoring what came before, but also acknowledging that we are a continuance of that and we take responsibility for that. Uh, the same can be true for dance and other types of performances. Um, the symbols and graphics that were used during that period and in earlier stages of history are ones that we kind of rescue, but then we reinvent and update to kind of, uh, not just to take something whole cloth, but to find a way to continue it in a way that makes sense for like the current struggles. Like you can particularly see that in the incorporation of um, queer liberation struggles and much broader ideas of gender and you know beyond the idea of framing ourselves as a women's struggle, we don't do that so much. We were a feminist struggle and understanding that the people who fight that are the ones who suffer directly under patriarchy. So these are kind of concepts that weren't necessarily in play so much for the previous generations, but we can take their practices and incorporate these new analyses and kind of build on them and expand them. And uh, yeah, and we have like the practice of memory, right? Not just of researching our history, but of commemorating, like commemorating martyrs, like those who were killed or disappeared during the dictatorship, but also victims of femicide, right? Now people will uh, commemorate them the same way using some of the same traditions that also extends to now, um, for example, women who were um, socio-environmental or indigenous activists who were killed for their activism, or even more recently, uh, Black migrant women, uh, Haitians who have been killed or at least neglected in a way that resulted in their death right? Basically different forms of state violence. So even as we have new people arriving to this territory, we are already incorporating their oppression and their resistance into what we're doing today. And I think art and culture is so flexible in that, is that we can invite people into our narratives and symbols and practices in a way, right? So we can always be, uh, we're never too fixed in time. And that flexibility that doesn't sacrifice history and memory, I think is something very valuable like in this time. Going back to what you're saying, Malema, about reconstructing relationships, there's a certain like politics of refusal that goes into refusing the way things are and then injecting life into the way that things could be, which is inherently activism. And even in choosing what to create is, um, I guess, activism in its own way. You were just talking about commemoration and memory, um, which is a great segue into my next question. I want to talk about um, like the, the anniversary of the protests in Chile is coming up on the 19th. Um, and it makes me think about collective remembrance here in Canada. 
where the state now recognizes September 30th as National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. So um, it was formerly Orange Shirt Day to um, commemorate survivors of residential schools and those who didn't come home and their families. But I'm wondering what the limitations of such um, state sanctioned dates of remembrance when they become opportunities to buy orange donuts. And so I'm wondering what your observations have been on the outcome of these state implemented days of recognition as they have come and gone, um, especially where there's ongoing violence. And if there is sort of a politics of refusal of these days of commemoration and how people are maybe taking them back in their own ways. I could go. Yeah, whoever's ready, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, we don't have uh, official days, right? But we have our own days. Uh, for example, September 11th. Like for us, that is a day of struggle and commemoration. And there are a lot of practices associated with that. Um, the perhaps most important one in Santiago is that there is a procession from the downtown area to the general cemetery in uh, the north of the city, right? And then the groups that have participated in the march break off to um, usually to go to different parts of the cemetery where they will um, have a conversation, have a speech, do a political intervention, do a cultural uh, activity, usually near the grave of a martyr, right? Like for example, Victor Jara's grave is there, but also a lot of other people, right? And it's um, usually a very intense march with very, very strong police repression. And like I went uh, this year for the first time in a few years because it was actually like too violent for me. <laughs> I couldn't handle it, but I decided to return to it because now that the pandemic has receded a little bit, uh, everyone I knew felt it was really important to kind of return to this day of commemoration in force. And also within that March, we also were remembering um, the people who are in prison today, right? Like particularly um, uh, indigenous Mapuche activists, right? Who are political prisoners. And then also people who are in prison because of protesting during the revolt. So yeah, that's how we remember. We remember by fighting, right? We remember by mobilizing, like memory is a very active and physical thing that we do here. So. And we have many other days that we take just as seriously, like throughout the calendar year. It's amazing to hear that brief. So I, I um, I'm trying to think, <laughs> trying to think of of something similar. But I'm afraid we've we've got a lot of our own orange donuts actually, um, oh. unfortunately. Um, when when the kind of political regime changed, a lot of really radical remembrance days became formal national states remembrance days that used to be kind of um, community, community run and very repressed times. But um, yeah, I mean, when those people then took over the state, they took their, their memorial days with them and they have definitely um, lost a lot of that kind of meaning and, and position. There are a number of um, organizations that still sort of remain um, that used to be kind of support and memory, kind of trauma support organizations from that period. Um, but they've gotten increasingly smaller um, and sort of less influential. Um, and so I can't actually think, to be honest, and it, I might be, might be missing something, but I can't really think of an, a good example of a kind of retaining of radical memory under this kind of framework of the states, kind of capturing, I suppose, um, what used to be quite radical moments. Um, and, and, and in that process, we've definitely had, yeah, like, you know, government officials will go out, they'll, they'll cut ribbons. Um, they're the same people who used to be, you know, in the slogan t-shirts being beaten by the police. Um, <laughs> and um, are now in their suits with their, their big tummies um, and drinking lots of whiskey. I'd like, yeah, I, I'm not coming with anything uh, inspirational here, I'm afraid. I'll just stop. <laughs>
<laughs> but I think I think that's the point of it, though. I think that's yeah. what I, I'm encountering too. Is that I, I see these commemoration events, and I see the prime minister there. I see leaders there, and so I think that they almost represent a ceiling of behavior in such Absolutely. cases, right? And so that challenges the imagination because, like. You, if Justin's not doing it, like, what am I supposed to do? And then it goes back to this like collective versus individual reaction to change. Mm -hmm. and so, um, for me, like um, Brie talking about how commemorations make us angry, that makes me angry. <laughs> so thinking about the lack of commemoration, commemorations. Yeah. Absolutely. And like rethinking about, um, it's like the state allowing us this little area to practice our commemoration or whatever, but it's, mm -hmm. it's not really doing anything. Mm -hmm. um, with that, I think maybe we should open up to our audience who's been very attentive with their um, time today, who's joined us. And I think Max is gonna help facilitate that. Thank, thank you, you Tina. And thank you to our guests for these uh, phenomenal presentations. It's been a real, um, I've learned a lot. And it's been so wonderful to have these reflections that come, you know, about a week ago, we had our National Day for Truth and Reconciliation in Canada. and. A lot of discussions about what that means and I feel like the internationalizing this uh, conversation really really helps um, open it up in interesting ways. I do want to invite folks to uh, chime in now and share their positions and I'll, what I'll do is I'll maybe ask us to gather uh, four or so uh, impulses as they like to say here in Germany, impulses. Um, and then I'll turn it back over to our guests just so we can get a lot of voices. Um, if you want to type your question into the chat, you're welcome to. Otherwise, I'll call on you. And if you want to unmute yourself and or uh, un uh, add your video, you're welcome to do so in a minute. While you're just percolating on the question, I do want to say um, that we are in the process of planning two more events for this calendar year. Uh, hopefully in late October, or early November, we're going to have an event uh, where we're going to be speaking about the similarities and differences between struggles against racism, uh, occupation and settler colonialism in Palestine and on Turtle Island. Uh, we're just confirming guests and seeing what we can do uh, around that, but we hope to have some news about that very soon. And then on November 25th, uh, we have confirmed the participation of Isa Fromo and Jay Jordan who are two activists uh, and artists and uh, movement facilitators who um, left their good jobs in the city to uh, move to a zone called uh, the ZAD in Western France, which has won uh, just last year or the year before a really decisive battle against the French state to create a kind of autonomous zone for reconnecting people in the earth and living autonomously and in sort of cooperation. So it should be a very, um, exciting talk that's coming up on November 25th, and we should announce that soon. So let's um, maybe turn to our um, questions. If you have a question you'd like to pose in person, please uh, raise your hand. I see Leslie has, has raised his hand and I will ask him to speak in a moment. And before I do that, I'm just gonna pass on a couple of questions that have been sent in the chat here. So Nehi asks um, to both speakers, where is the place of state restitution in apology? I mean, in cases of individual malfeasance, we almost always require restitution beyond apology. Here we might think of financial restitution, maybe criminal charges, etc. And are apologies simply enough in the case of state orchestrated in injustices? And uh, Bethany asks, Exploitation of social movements at its finest, uh, with some of the biggest companies coming out with these orange shirts to support the indigenous that they don't actually do anything for their communities, uh, which is more of a comment. And then uh, Larry writes, Bree, do you know anything about commemorations of the repression in Argentina, uh, next door to Chile? Um, Leslie, would you like to pose your question verbally or with video? Um, I can do it with both if you guys don't mind taking a look at my mug. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure, go ahead. Okay, um, thank you so very much. And I want to also thank the um, both ladies for your presentations. I'm realizing that we have time limits and I know there are other participants, so I, I need to choose one and it's nothing personal. Um, Brie, mucho gusto. I would love to talk to you some more because in my other life I was a... Um, I was an offshore banker and I've done some pretty, pretty questionable things in the name of my former country. 
of my country of birth, which brings me to Molemo. Thank you so very much. I'm originally from the Bahamas. And actually, both of you ladies, when you spoke, I just saw parallel upon parallel about parallel. But um, particularly Molemo, I'm, I'm sorry, but I just was targeted on you for my saw it was announced because the Bahamas and South Africa share so much in common. Um, we fought very hard um, as an independent nation that we got in 1973 for South Africa's um, um, freedom, right? Um, that was well-documented. I think the Bahamas was one of the first, if not the first nation in the United Nations to, to start that work. So when Nelson Mandela was freed and in his capacity as president, one of the first countries he visited was mine. And I was so proud. And the one thing that he said, and it sticks with me to this day, was he, and you said it as well, he talked about, okay, you guys have this political freedom, but unless you have economic control, it's not happening. So in, in learning about the history of, of the country that I was taking, my people were taken to as slaves. It was discovered that as we were fighting for our, our independence, majority rule, in the 1960s, and I want to know if you're aware of this, there was a deal between the United Bahamian Party, which was the, the British, um, I guess, government of the day, had an agreement with South Africa. And there was a plan to bring South Africans, none looking like you, of course, white South Africans to pop to increase the white population in the Bahamas. This was in the 1960s. There is an area designated for it. I mean, and it only came out during political elections, I think maybe in the 70s or 80s, but it just disappeared, right? Because unlike South Africa, we never had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And therefore, everything both you and Bri are talking about just resonate with me on so many levels. But please, if you aren't able to answer me this now, if I can leave you with my email address, because this is something that's, that's a passion of mine, and I'm in Canada now and everything lines up the same way you're both saying it, but there's that connection going back to that, the link between the Bahamas and Canada and, and South Africa, I'm sorry, is just too crucial. And because once we got our independence, once you got your independence, it was then discovered that Sol Kersner builds Atlantis in the Bahamas. But then guess what? He then, after all of that is done, sells thousands and thousands of acres of land that he had held in the Bahamas during the time of apartheid. This was from the 1970s. Then he is selling it now back to the population. So there's a lot of history there. And I just want to understand that connection because without knowing that in my past, I can't be of any good use to, to indigenous peoples here in, in my new home, which is call Canada, right? So sorry to run on so much, but if, if you can just add some light to that, either here or later on for me, I'd, I'd be very grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you, Leslie. Um, guests, do you do you have some responses that uh, you'd like to share at this point? I can also share more from our, from our audience. And again, audience, we do have a little bit of extra time. So if you do want to chime in, please do in the chat or uh, raise your hand. Maybe I can jump in um, right away. Thank you so much, Leslie. I mean, I, I actually did not know about, I, I know about the Bahamas support of, um, uh, yeah, the, I suppose the independence of South Africa, um, but I did not know about this sort of pre-connection. Uh, uh, it does sound quite likely. I know that, um, I mean, South Africa, like many other white supremacist nations had a poor white problem. Um, which was this kind of uh, embarrassment of, of uh, a section of the white population that didn't uphold the idea of supremacy. Um, and their approach to that was often to ship them out. Um, and so, for example, sent a number to, to Namibia um, to be farmers in Namibia as a way to kind of um, improve their lot in society. Um, and there were a number of those kinds of projects. So it, it could be something in relation to that. So, so, so it wouldn't surprise me, but it wouldn't surprise me in one sense, but in another, very surprising. Um, and, and similarly with Sol Kozner, um, there's, there's quite a lot of history on him. Um, again, wouldn't necessarily surprise me. Um, and, and kind of connects maybe to that first question around land. Um, and, and Sol Kozner, of course, um, he, uh, I'll do this quickly, he had, a, um, he had relationships with, um, Black 
leadership in what were I said were actually modeled um, bun, what we call Bantustans, but were modeled off reserves in Canada um, for uh, Black South Africans, which tried to put the majority of population into reserves. <laughs> you, can, you can imagine what that land is like, um, and and most of most of the African population remains in those kinds of spaces, um, which are completely overgrazed, like uh, really difficult um, spaces to live, and. Um, Sol Kersner was kind of um, part, was, was close with a number of these Bantistan leaders um, who were kind of independent land leaders in a sense, but under a, a, an apartheid created system. Um, and those kinds of questions around land ownership very much remain the, the primary kind of question of restitution in, in South Africa um, and the need to return the kinds of, um, various forms of the means of production, I suppose, um, into black hands, because that just hasn't happened by and large. And where it has, has been within um, certain kinds of neoliberal systems that come with very little political power um, uh, in the process or, or not, not meaningful, meaningful political power. Um, and, and that kind of, that economic question really at this stage is the kind of uh, glaring question of the country. Um, and we have a number of systems, we have like a, a very well established um, um, sort of positive discrimination process in terms of contracts and those kinds of things, because of course we now have a government that is, is black run. And so that's very much part of the legal systems, um, but it's a, a sort of trickle down type um, approach to that doesn't work, we, we know that. Um, and, and still fits very much within these kinds of neoliberal systems. So I think a lot of, resonance with, with both what you said and what Bree has said. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, and that's really where the restitution question remains for our, our country very much. But definitely let's, let's share emails. I'd, I'd be interested to hear more. Um, Bree, I think there was a question there too about uh, maybe the situation in Argentina and how it might be similar to uh, Chile and then, for both of you, there was this question around, um, is there the need for a kind of restitution, a kind of material restitution beyond just the apology? Um, to address the question about Argentina. So uh, I'm not an expert on what happens in terms of the institutional level there, but I know on the social movement level, we share a lot of similarities, uh, particularly as um, as feminists, we both have very large, well-developed um, feminist movements that share an anti-liberal and anti-authoritarian perspective. So there is a lot of mutual energy sharing between us. And I know that absolutely they commemorate uh, their own days and they also remember their own martyrs. And of course, unfortunately, that list is uh, that list of names is always being added to in Argentina as here. And so the people who are disappeared are not only the ones that were disappeared during our uh, respective dictatorships. Um, in terms of restitution, um, restitution did take place here. I do know that there was a certain degree of like property being returned. Like I know, for example, like, um, the Socialist Party had all of its like assets seized, I think, and those were returned. And, but in a way, you know, this is a big conversation to open up, but I could say that it, in a way, I don't know if it helped because it kind of was more about preserving like the status quo, like, hey, look, you can have some stuff back. Look, you can kind of return to political life. The Socialist Party was, uh, had two presidents, you know, in the, after the return to democracy, right? And yeah, so it was like, you know, we have just as many um, rich, powerful people from the left here, maybe not as many from the left as from the right, but we know what it's like to suffer under a socialist president here, right? We know that they're happy to preserve like damaging economic policies. They're happy to use um, the police and military against protesters who question the system. So like some forms of restitution, 
maybe we're not the ones that would, were designed to heal the wounds. But there are some like different types of policies that I know about that I do like. For example, um, we have a very like lax uh, immigration criteria for Venezuelans because they accepted Chilean exiles. Right, they were a country that accepted a lot of Chileans like during the dictatorship because Chileans were forced to flee the country or sent all over the world, right? And because of that, even now that we have a government that's cracking down on uh, immigration in a pretty brutal way, uh, escalating over the past couple of years, like Venezuelans have been allowed a, a somewhat easier path than other migrants. Uh, but of course, even that has its limits because now uh, just recently in the past week, we're seeing some really violent, xenophobic, anti-migrant uh, protests. Right? Um, most recently against uh, encampments of Venezuelans who are trying to move through the country. But there's also been a lot of specifically like anti-Black, anti-migrant Haitian, uh, like violence against Haitian migrants. Like, and now of course we can see the consequence of that in the US as Haitian migrants are leaving Chile because it's a place where they have very little opportunity forced uh, to pay high rents in slums, working for nothing and experiencing anti-Black racism. So it, for me, when I saw these people arriving you know, on the US border, I say, yeah, I understand why they would try their luck because the, the context here has become so hostile for them economically and culturally and socially. Um, thanks, thanks for that, Bree. Um, guests, uh, any final words before we let our uh, audience go and, and call it a day? Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Malemo and Bree, for joining us. Uh, I'm sure I share everyone's uh, great admiration for, for what you've shared with us today, and, and great thanks for it as well. And thanks also uh, to Tina for facilitating uh, our discussion with our guests. Thanks to the audience for uh, coming. And I, one thing I did want to just draw out before we conclude is that one thing that we heard from both Malemo and Bree um, in, in the presentations is how important uh, international solidarity efforts were to bringing an end to the uh, apartheid regime in, in South Africa and the Pinochet uh, regime in Chile. Um, so and just a shout out to the importance of having more conversations like these and building our international solidarity and uh, networking our struggles around the world uh, to come to some sort of better, better world for us and those who will come after us. Um, so thank you so much and uh, look forward to the next time we all gather together either virtually or in person. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Marino. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Wonderful. It was a beautiful way to think about land back too.